Well, hey, good evening out there, everybody. Thanks for joining us on time here. We're gonna get started shortly, okay? Before we do, I would love to know where our attendees are logging in from tonight. So let us know in the chat box uh, because we, we wanna hear from you. All right, UCLA, Los Angeles, Boston. Thank you for joining us. Toronto, Mexico, Michigan, Vancouver, Charlotte, Texas, Newfoundland, outstanding. Arkansas, NYC, Montreal, Montreal, Ontario, Windsor, Ontario. Outstanding. Well, thanks for sharing everyone. It's, it's great to see uh, the community within North America attending with us this evening. My name is Devin. I'm the National Sales Manager at Univet. Uh, and thank you on behalf of everyone at Univet for joining us. Um, before we get started with our second webinar series tonight, I wanted to just remind everyone attending that if you haven't gone to our uh, Instagram page or Dr. Stevenson's Instagram and YouTube page, please go there during the break, give us a follow and a shout out and make sure to invite your friends and colleagues if you found this information helpful, invite them to the webinar. Let's spread uh, the good word and, and techniques of Dr. Stevenson to your colleagues and peers and pass that gift along to them. Before we get the, the webinar uh, kicked off, I wanted to just maybe open up the, the webinar to you, the attendees, and see if, if anyone out there had any questions from the previous webinar or just maybe some general questions that you wanted to ask Dr. Stevenson or us at Univet before we get started. So we'll get started very shortly, but if you do have some questions, please uh, put them in the chat box or turn on your camera and raise your hand and we'd be happy to hear from you. Thanks. So PDF for the last session, uh, we'll get that out to you, Mohammed. thank you. Any um, announcements before you get started, Dr. Stevenson? Okay. Calgary, all right. Well, okay, I, I say we get started. Great, thank you, Devin, and welcome back everybody. It's good to see that we have about 100 people with us today, uh, that's awesome. And uh, we are going to, uh, have ample opportunity to address your concerns, your questions, your ideas, your observations, anything. Um, I pride myself on being very approachable. Uh, I think that um, if we can be friends and share the information freely with each other, uh, we we both benefit. So um, thank you for your your attendance, and I'm going to do my best to. Um, help you uh, understand some of the things that I have learned and uh, maybe some practical techniques too. So let's get rolling. Uh, we left off with onlays, but I thought I would just spend a minute with inlays just to make sure that we're all uh, clear about, about when we would do inlays. And um, I don't perform inlays nearly as often as onlays. And there's a good reason for that. And that reason is that, um, whoops, excuse me. That reason is that oftentimes we can perform direct composite restorations. And really the only time that I'm gonna to resort to a ceramic inlay is if a patient asks for it. And I had a patient just recently that wanted to have two, two amalgams replaced and they were, they were uh, nice amalgams, but he wanted them replaced with uh, ceramic, and he asked specifically for inlays. Uh, another reason would be where you have uh, difficult access, and we've all dealt with those monstrously difficult class twos, and we're trying to get some good contours, we're trying to develop some nice anatomy, and you leave the procedure feeling like you have not done your best work. 
And, you know, we have to, as dentists, always strive for excellence, no doubt about it. But it doesn't mean everything we do is excellent. Okay? And that's not what it means at all. Excellence is a commitment to being better, a commitment to evaluating your work and seeing if you can perform at a higher level the next time you do the same procedure. But sometimes the results are less than optimal. And I think that a ceramic inlay may make our composites in those situations look be, be in other words, look better because they're made from an indirect procedure. Regardless, you've got to have enamel periphery remaining unless you're doing a margin elevation procedure. But remember that margin elevation procedures, although they're very exciting and they do afford us with some opportunities to save two structure, they are not extremely well tested in the literature. Uh, they are going to fail earlier than a, than a procedure without margin elevation. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, they're difficult to do. And sometimes we have to look at the, the big picture and decide when there's, when there's no enamel remaining on one of the boxes, for example, sometimes those are good indications to just move into an onlay or even some kind of a crown procedure so we can get long-term results. We don't want to perform inlays on endodontically treated teeth. Uh, not a good idea. Uh, we have experimented with this using fiber reinforcements. Um, and there are definitely cases that can be successful. But as a rule, I think it would be really wise for us to, to leave the vital, uh, the non-vital teeth to the onlays and crowns and not to the inlays. One of my caveats when it comes to ceramic inlays and onlays is that I must be able to isolate. And what I mean by isolation is I mean rubber dam. And rubber dam is a, a procedure that I think is pretty much, it goes hand in hand with really good bonded ceramics. Uh, the material of choice, of course, is uh, going to be lithium disilicate because we can bond to lithium disilicate in very predictable ways. But let's not forget, that we can also perform zirconia inlays and onlays. Uh, zirconia, we can bond chemically to the zirconia interface quite predictably. And although it may not have the widespread understanding of bondability, it is in fact well established in the literature and in practice that zirconia is an excellent material that one can bond to. We just have to know how to do it correctly. But my material of choice typically is lithium disilicate. And then these must be adhesively delivered with a dual cure cement, preferably. But also, you could use a warm composite technique where you're light curing through the tooth as long as the inlay is not overly dark or thick. So if you have a, a nice, normal, uniform thickness, you can, you can get enough conversion of the warm composite to, to uh, have a predictable result. And when we discussed the when to do direct versus indirect last time, we did break this into these three areas where we're looking at the width of the isthmus, the proximal box size, and then the pulpal depth. And this, this beautiful algorithm here was established by a group out of the University of Illinois to look at when would be the appropriate time to move to an indirect restoration, not just the, the indication I provided you with, which was the difficulty of access, but also just looking at the size of the restoration and whether you've already broken contact, um, if it's more than three millimeters wide across the isthmus, and then if we have pulpal depth, that's great. These, these are guidelines. I can absolutely appreciate the ability of many clinicians to restore a tooth that would fit this criteria for indirect ceramics. I can appreciate being able to do that with direct composite, absolutely. And I think that we're in a situation now where composites can be performed very, very well with uh, techniques that mitigate shrinkage, uh, we have high wear resistant composites. We have amazing techniques now where we can possibly uh, perform very, very large composites that in the past we were not able to even consider. So uh, inlays are not a huge part of my practice. I don't think they are a big part of most people's practices because they, they usually can be performed quite nicely with direct composite.
Now, I'm just going to review this briefly, but basically, you know, the, the ceramic preparation that we need to look at that has most of, most of the walls are going to be made of dentin, and then you're going to have enamel periphery. So we're not talking about veneers here. We're talking about large, thick restorations. We need to have good bulk, and we need to have smooth internal walls. And, and, and that's really critical. And another aspect that is probably a little less well understood, I think, is that if the inlay is thinner, um, it, I'm sorry, if it's more uniform in thickness and don't have large areas that are thick and small areas that are really thin, um, we can have better precision. And this is something that really doesn't get discussed very often, but it's a, it's a fascinating finding having uh, been in the laboratory world for a long time, uh, performing most of my own lab work. I can tell you that when you have an inlay that is more uniform in thickness, you get a better fit. And that is a fascinating realization. So this idea that we discussed about last time about blocking out and building the tooth back up to, to full contour and then cutting the ideal preparation makes a heck of a lot of sense uh, from a standpoint of tooth structure uh, uh, preservation, but also accuracy of the fit of the inlay restoration. So uh, let's look for 1.5 millimeters in the center. And as I discussed in the past, we want to take a look at the angulation of the walls as they're coming down towards the center of, of, of that isthmus width. And that's the area where we're looking for that 1.5 millimeters. That means your walls are going to be pretty tall up here at the from the pulpal to the occlusal surface, you may in fact have walls that are as much as three millimeters tall because you're not concerned about the height of the walls at the periphery as much as you are the thickness of the inlay in the center after the anatomy has been established. And for that reason, I love using a 330 carbide burr. The 330 carbide burr is going to uh, create conversion walls, which is exactly the opposite of what you want, right? You want divergency, but it's a really great depth cutting uh, burr for this purpose. Okay. And uh, we love the 847KR. Uh, it's a terrific burr. It was designed for ceramic inlays many, many years ago. Uh, it's one of the most popular burrs in the world when it comes to inlay preparations and onlay preparations. There are others that have more rounded edges, but these are quite popular. And you know that when you have an extra eight in front of the number 847, that means that it's a fine diamond. So you'll have a red stripe on there. And then the, the regular grit diamond, which has a hundred micron grit, is gonna not have any stripe on it at all. It's gonna just be the color of the, of the metal. Uh, if it has a black stripe, that would be 150 micron, which would be considered to be um, a coarse burr. And then something in between medium coarse burr would have a green stripe around it. So I like to either use a red, uh, a black stripe, no stripe, or a green stripe to start the preparations and then refine them always with the red stripe. And I showed you this case from one of my friends uh, who just... Uh, this is, you know, just routine dentistry in in the in the practice. Uh, the preparations are not necessarily perfect by any means, but they're quite well done. And they've got the rounded line angles, the proper thickness, flowing outline forms, and the exit angles that seem to be approaching something close to 90 degrees. Uh, I like to go a little bit more like 91 to about 110. And they seem to be pretty nicely done. Um, it's good solid work, uh, particularly considering the fact that this person had no intention of taking pictures that day until I bopped in and said, hey, uh, take some pictures and uh, send them to me because I want I want to show off your your nice prep. So that was that was, uh, you know, a nice work. These are inlays. It's kind of hard to even see the delineation between the inlay and the crown itself. So uh, quite a successful uh, operation, I would think. Uh, and just showing you here that when you have preparations, they should be clean, they should have good draw. In other words, you should be able to see all the walls. And you notice here that when I'm taking the impression, um, 
I'm placing the cord with the rubber dam still in place. And that may seem really strange, but it works great because the patient doesn't have to taste the cord and you can cut the rubber dam and then inject, you place the cord and then uh, carry on with uh, removing the rubber dam and then taking the final impression. Uh, I love using the two cord technique. Uh, the first cord is a pretty small cord, usually a size zero. And then the second cord is usually either a one or a two, sometimes a three. And I prefer the braided cords versus the knitted cords. Most people use knitted cords. And um, the, the theory is that those cords will expand when in fact they really, they really quite, quite readily contract and they collapse very easily. And so if you're having some trouble getting good separation between the gingival margin and your margin itself, your, your finish line, you may wanna try shifting over to a braided cord, which is much more difficult to place because it's thicker, but once it's placed, it does magical retraction of that sulcular area. And you can get terrific impressions. And this is just showing you in this slide here that the, the bottom cord, the first cord that we placed came out with the impression. And if you look from the side view, you can see that the margins have been captured quite nicely and the cord is not interfering with the interface uh, between the, the finish line and the unprepared two structure, okay? And this is uh, how we would do this routinely in practice so that we, we consistently uh, were able to obtain impressions that don't have flaws due to operator errors uh, whenever possible. And then your impressions, um, after they're poured up, they can be clean like this. Uh, this works the same way for scanning too. So if you're scanning for your restorations, and I scan lots of uh, my procedures as well, uh, you're going to want to still manage the tissue, right? Just because you're using a scanner doesn't let you off the hook from tissue management. If anything, your, your tissue management with a scanner has to be even better. Uh, and then the temporization technique that I love to use, it's not very um, sophisticated, but it's very practical. Uh, we utilize a product called DuraSeal, and this is a material that stays flexible, okay? It doesn't get hard. You can flow it over the preparations, and then it peels out uh, quite nicely after two weeks, three weeks, a month, whatever it takes to get your inlays done. Normally, my turnaround in my practice is about a week to two weeks at the most. So you can uh, tell your patient they're not going to floss their teeth. There's no cement in here. They, we just lay this material on top of the teeth uh, and it seals the margins and the patients actually perform quite well. So uh, that was it for inlays. Let's move to onlays. This is really where we uh, left off last time. And let's go ahead and give you the, the indications. And that would be this pretty much the same as an inlay, but we can also treat it. And in this particular case, endodontically treat, uh, treated teeth can be restored very nicely with onlays. Now, this is a huge uh, misconception out there that endodontically treated teeth need full crowns. And uh, that's just simply not true. It hasn't been shown to be the case in the literature. And what, what is important to understand is that anatomically treated teeth in the posterior are best and work most predictably treated with at least an onlay all the way up to a full crown. Uh, we don't wanna treat those with direct restorations or with inlays if we can. In the anterior, it's a different story. The forces on anterior teeth are very different. The access openings don't, don't uh, have nearly as much deleterious effects on the overall tooth structure. And so we can uh, place just simple fillings oftentimes on incisors and canines, where on premolars and molars, we're better off performing an on-leg. And the same thing, I, I need to isolate. And I now have monolithic zirconia as a definite option for onlays, particularly in a patient that has uh, heavy bite forces, uh, perhaps they might even have a diagnosis of parafunction, uh, whether that's bruxism or clenching or habits of some kind, it, it can be helpful to consider onlays made of zirconia in certain situations. Uh, but my go-to material usually is still lithium bisilicate. 
And once again, these have to be adhesively delivered. They cannot be cemented, although there is some interesting work being done looking at cementing uh, monolithic zirconia onlays with more conventional cementation techniques without having to worry about adhesively bonding them. Uh, I would be cautious in, in, in heading in that direction. I think I would stay with the adhesive delivery of zirconia restorations as same as we would do for lithium to silicon. Uh, onlay preparations uh, can take on many different forms. And you can see here that this is more of a traditional onlay form. Okay, where I have uh, on the functional cusp on the right hand side, I have a shoulder or a wraparound. Let's call it a cap, a cap like a baseball cap. You're, you're capping over that cusp, but on the facial side is, is shooed, like you're putting a shoe on a horseshoe on a horse. And so it just lays over. But what you don't see is you don't see uh, a shoe on both sides. You see a cap on one side and a shoe on the other. And this is my go to approach. Uh, is that on the non-functional cusps, we want to have uh, the reduction is, is, is a millimeter and a half to two millimeters, bulk of ceramic at the margin, avoid sharp line angles. And then uh, over here on the, uh, uh, and I have these labeled backwards. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened, but the, the label that says two millimeters reduction over the functional cusp should be on the right-hand side. And then the one that says 1.5 millimeters should be on the left side. Sorry about that. But on the left-hand side, you have the non-functional cusp. On the right-hand side, you have the functional cusp. So this wrap over, um, and uh, it makes a, a lot of sense to increase the resistance form of the restoration. And you might say, wait a second, I thought we had bonding. Uh, why do we have to cover over that cusp? Why not just make it flat? Why not just have a V shape? And that's a really great question. But and in fact, it was such a great question that one of my master's students studied that very topic for her master's thesis. And what she discovered in her beautiful study that was performed at UCLA that earned her a master's degree, what she discovered was that when you wrap over like this anatomically, the failure rate of those restorations was significantly reduced. So having, having a wrap over makes a heck of a lot of sense to increase the resistance and retention form of the final restoration, uh, rather than just making it flat. And that's the shoulder that I was talking about uh, right there. Okay. So you may say, no, wait a minute, what about this preparation? This has a wrap over on both sides, both the non-functional cusp, which would be on the left, and the functional cusp on the right. What, what is it that dictated this type of design? Well, the, you have to just remember that sometimes teeth have cracks. Uh, maybe there's some thin walls that we want to wrap around and reduce and, and increase our resistance form. Uh, maybe even uh, lower molar endodontically treated tooth. This might be your go-to method for placing onlays on a tooth of that type. But the key here is that we, we and I know this goes against a lot of popular thought right now. Um, a lot of popular thought is just tabletop with a little bit of a bevel going out towards the edges. I know very well all about biomedic dentistry. I know the people who are writing the papers. I know the leaders in all of these groups. but it, it, the the research doesn't back up clinically just leaving things flat. So for long-term survivability, this type of restoration makes a lot more sense to me. And, and there, I have a lot of respect for guys out there that are doing a lot of these innovative things, but let's keep them as innovative, potentially excellent, but not necessarily confirmed by clinical trials. I think that would be a fair thing to say. I am going to keep my eye on this topic and my and my brain open. I will be open-minded about what might be coming. And in maybe in two years from now, if I give this lecture, I would say this is how we used to do it right here in this picture. So uh, please try to understand that I have to I have to make strides forward in a very systematic evidence-based manner. And I can't just say, yeah, the new prep is this because I saw it on Instagram 
or uh, a very famous person is lecturing and says, oh, this is how I prep teeth now. We should all do it my way. That doesn't fly for me. I have to uh, appreciate the science before I'm going to make a major shift. Okay. So the prep should look uh, like this sometimes when you have maybe a really severely broken down tooth that doesn't need a crown. It may look something more like this. The key is to keep things smooth and flowing. And I think for me as an operator, uh, having a smooth and continuous outline is probably one of the most challenging things to do. Uh, I can do the reduction and I can do the boxes and I can do these shoulders or fillet finish lines, but to get them all to connect together in a, in a smooth manner takes a lot of effort. And that's probably where I spend most of my time on my preparation is how to make all of these angles smooth and flowing. I love this slide because it sort of sums up everything I've just been saying with three different possible designs. On the top, you have essentially it's an inlay that has an onlay of one cusp. So uh, the facial cusp on the left has been preserved and the lingual cusp, which is the functional cusp, this is a maxillary uh, first molar, uh, has, been, has been covered. And you can see the, the diagram or the images on the right-hand side, you can see that the way that this preparation might appear as we look at it from different views. The middle one is where, uh, and this is probably my go-to preparation design in most situations would be the shoeing of the non-functional cusp and the capping of the functional cusp. And that's exactly what the middle one is showing. On the left-hand side, you can see you've got the, the angulation of the cusp angle is reduced. The ceramic is going to cover over the facial. It doesn't wrap, but it shoes it, and it fits with a, with a butt joint finish line. And then on the right-hand side, that's your lingual cusp, and this is a maxillary molar, so this is our functional cusp, right? So it's wrapping over and creating this capping effect of that particular cusp. And then you can see the various different views of this particular preparation. Now, the bottom one is more like the one I just showed you. And so we're capping over both the facial and the lingual cusps in order to uh, increase the resistance or retention form based on clinical findings, based on something that compelled us to give this a little bit more strength. I would also say that you can uh, extend the walls axially further towards the gingiva as needed due to things you might encounter, like you may encounter a crack, or there may be a class five restoration, which almost connects to your margin. And you're like, gosh, I think it'd be better if we just wrapped all the way past that class five, or uh, perhaps a cusp is missing. So we can drop the margin down and include the cusp. I love doing onlays and I love the variations because they, they make dentistry fun. And uh, it's sort of a, I guess you could call it a, you know, kind of like a dynamic diagnosis. You, the diagnosis evolves as you enter the tooth and you start with an inlay and then you evolve to the onlay and to variations of the onlay that may in fact make the, the final preparation look a lot more like a crown than maybe you initially thought. But the, the cool thing is you make these decisions based on the factors that you see while you're engaging in the dentistry itself. Now, I just grabbed this one from the internet, uh, and I don't really like it, but it does show you the difference essentially between an inlay and an onlay. But you look at the margins here on this, this, this middle one here, the margins on the facial and lingual don't look very good at all. Interestingly, this was being... Uh, uh, used as an advertisement for a laboratory as how great they did their work. And, and I, I just was a little bit, um, I guess, kind of shocked a little bit because the margins are not wonderful by any means. And I don't think I would have prepared the teeth this way either. On that middle tooth, that molar, I would definitely have onlaid those facial cusps and not left them like this because it leaves those functional cusps highly vulnerable to wear and to chipping. In fact, if you look carefully right here where my pointer is, you can see there's already a little area of erosion where there's exposed dentin uh, and, and to not cover that while you're engaging in a procedure that costs the patient a lot of money is, is not, not a very nice thing. 
aesthetically, these look nice though. I mean, they look really lovely, but in terms of the design, the preparations, I, I certainly uh, see some areas where they could be improved. Um, survival rates for pressed uh, monolithic uh, lithium desilicate glass ceramic crowns when they're when they're when they're looked at very carefully by people like Ken Malamet, who is a legend in this particular arena of bonded ceramics. He's probably the um, the world's you know, most experienced expert in the area of bonded onlays and inlays. And when you look at this cumulative survival of pressed lithium desilicate for inlays, about 94% at 10 years, onlays about 98% at 10 years. And you may wonder, well, wait a second, onlays are not as successful as inlays? Well, yeah, first of all, we're, we're, we don't even know if that's significant, right? But you have to understand that a lot of times onlays are done on teeth that are severely broken down. Um, and uh, inlays may be done on teeth that are less broken down. Oh, I'm sorry, I got that 93.9% .9 for inlays, 98% for onlays, my bad. So now I'm trying to make sense of it. Okay, uh, inlays don't last as long as onlays. Why might that be? And well, it's because maybe inlays were attempted on a situation where the tooth really should have been onlay. Does that make sense? If you ever see a study that shows onlays that are lasting less than inlays, the, the understanding on that particular situation is that teeth that are more broken down may be treated with onlay, so they're already at a disadvantage. And that's what I was getting at. In this particular study, we're looking at pretty good results. I think I would be happy with 98% at almost 10 years. That's an excellent uh, survivability. And, you know, and um, it's, it's not common for us to find results that are uh, uh, any higher than this. Um, this is a Morimoto study. Uh, it was published a little bit earlier, and we're looking at survival rates of resin and ceramic inlays, onlays, overlays, a systematic review. And first of all, um, I don't even use the word overlay. Uh, I don't even, I don't know why you would need to use that term. Uh, we we really only need to use the terms inlay and onlay. But some people have added this thing called overlay. I don't even know what that is. It's certainly not something that I've ever. Uh, seen as a specific definition. We never taught that at UCLA. I'm not sure who's teaching that terminology, but it may exist out there. Um, okay, so what does this one show us? Uh, glass ceramics and, and even feldspathic porcelain, they're looking at success rates that are up to 95% at five years, 91% at 10 years, not quite as good as Dr. Malamet's study. The failure modes were, uh, you know, various, uh, but it looks like fractures and chipping was the was the highest failure method. So I think it's really important to to stay with the strongest pos possible materials. Um, this is including resin and ceramic inlays um, and feldspathics too, which are going to be much more prone to fractures. So this is a study that's looking at a little bit of a different population of onlays and inlays. Um, this is just another one to look at uh, ceramic uh, survival rate of ceramic and indirect composite restorations and uh, CAD cam success rates being 97% and 89% at 10 years, pressable being 95% at five years. So one would look at this and go, oh, wow, that looks like CAD cam is more successful than pressable. Uh, but once again, you need to look uh, a little bit deeper and find, and, and so you would never want to look at a study like this and go, aha, CAD cam is better than pressable. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, in fact, if you have to look at the operators too. So those doctors using CAD cam technology in their, in their offices, they know that when they prepare teeth, they have to prepare them really well because they're going to see all their mistakes right away. And and you can you can use the technology to help you prep better. Pressable, on the other hand, you take the impression, send it to the lab, you never have to look at it. So I think that our CAD CAM uh, clinicians out there uh, know this very well, that when you when you get CAD CAM into your office, it actually makes you a better dentist. And it, it absolutely does. It holds you accountable. So um, I don't think it's the technique so much as it is the operator. And then survival rates of uh, ceramic hybrid composite onlays, a nice big systematic review and meta-analysis here done by this group. 
published in 2020, looking up to 15 years. They're looking at survival rates, 94%. Composite, not quite as good. Lithium disilicate and hybrid materials, much, much higher. And, and I think that's really important for us to remember that really the, the champion in terms of survivability is going to be your lithium disilicate. Um, and I would stick with the winners when it comes to ceramic inlays and onlays. So I guess the big question is, what do you do inlay or onlay when uh, when the prep starts getting wide, when do you decide to cover over that cusp and when do you decide that you can leave it as an inlay? And this is just a follow-up to the same study done by the group out of University of Illinois. And I think that um, I, can, I can just cut to the chase and give you my answer. If you have any doubt at all about the restoration surviving, uh, you better onlay it. So when in doubt, cover it. When in doubt, onlay it. Because you, you have to remember that the longevity of these restorations could very well depend on your 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 just a slight modification in your preparation. And I'm always thinking, what is this restoration going to look like in 10 years, 15 or 20 years down the line? And I want it to last. I don't want the patient coming back in three or four or five years or even eight years and saying, oh, that onlay you made for me cracked. Uh, or it's bothering me and it has a leaky margin or something. Uh, so when in doubt, I will go for a more um, aggressive preparation. For, and that means, in other words, an onlay versus an inlay, which is an onlay is so much more conservative than, than a full crown, but I will push towards an onlay because I want this to last longer. Um, I guess you could take a look at, you know, these three aspects, occlusal forces, the width of the, the in the height of the cusps, and then occlusal contact relative to the distance of the margin, and give yourself some guidelines on when you would want to do an inlay versus an onlay. But let me let me show you the, the, the kind of more of a schematic here. So when the occlusal forces are just pushing down in the middle of the restoration, that could certainly be left as, as an inlay if there was nothing else wrong with the uh, with the tooth in question. However, when when the the margin is close to the contact area, like on the right hand side, and we've got a three millimeter tall wall in the box, and we have less than 1.5 millimeters of remaining tooth structure that would be a really good indication to follow that, that thinner green line and onlay that particular area. That's all we're talking about. It's just making a very small modification, but with a really great payback in terms of longevity. So uh, I think that, that, that that's what this recommendation is pointing towards. Um, when you look at the cusp width and height scenario, and we'd like to see well over a millimeter and a half for the inlays where you can have less than that for the onlays because you're going to onlay it. Um, and the height of the box, if the box is tall, there's more of a tendency for this to crack apart when if the box is very, very short, like if it's less than three millimeters. So that's what we mean by cusp, cusp height is we're referring to the height of the cusp measured from the gingival all the way up to the occlusal surface. Okay. So um, a really kind of a cool study that they came up with um, and their recommendations at Illinois are, are following this to this day. And then of course, whenever you have occlusal contacts that are right near the margins, I think that in the posterior, it's a really good idea to, to not allow that to happen and go ahead and onlay those areas. And is this the best possible answer to when to onlay versus inlay? Of course not. We just don't know. Uh, our profession is continuing to evolve. We don't have the 100% recommendation for every situation because there are some cases where we can perform inlays that violate some of these principles. And there are other times when we absolutely cannot. Uh, there are some situations where we need to be more aggressive and sometimes we can be more conservative based on patient factors that go beyond just the tooth factor, right? We have to consider aesthetics. We have to consider the patient's bite forces and their habits. We have to consider uh, how, how uh, qu the quality of the enamel, um, whether they have any wear on the tooth. There's a lot of other factors that will go into making these decisions. Uh, one of the things that I think is worth considering is to cover over the facial 
of your onlay all the way down to the gingival area when you have an aesthetic concern. Now, this patient had an aesthetic concern on a lower molar onlay and wanted to have the preparation extended down to the gingival level because he wanted to have this, there's the, uh, the provisional and the rubber dams being placed. And you can see it there on the, on the bottom right-hand side. He wanted to have the onlay wall, uh, the color of the ceramic flow down further towards the gingival, just like the unprepared adjacent premolar. And so in order to accomplish that without having a demarcation line, you needed to do, we needed to, to perform this procedure, which we would call a Vaughn lay. You could also call this a reverse three quarter crown or something like that. Um, the, um, uh, the common thing when you're doing onlays is that patients are going to see the distinction between the ceramic and the tooth structure. And that's really kind of a bummer. And so what this does is that it eliminates that completely. And generally, I will perform vonlays on maxillary premolars and sometimes first molars when the patient is, has, has expressed a concern that they must have this restoration blend with other teeth. Uh, a really good example of that is just imagine you're performing crowns on teeth numbers 13, 14, and 15, or you're, you're doing the, um, for you guys up in Canada, right? Let's see the two, five, two, six, two, seven. Okay. And then the, the first premolar is uh, going to receive an onlay and all the others are getting crowns in order for you to harmonize that quadrant. And you just do an onlay on the first premolar. It sets up a very difficult shade matching experience for you. The laboratory is going to have a very hard time with it. You have to sometimes, you almost wish you had a certain opacity in one area and a different opacity in the other area, but you can't do that with Emax. Emax is all monolithic, right? It's all one same material. So you, it, you know, you can do all the staining you want, but it's, it becomes extremely difficult to blend. But when you just simply include that buckle surface and you create a veneer that you connect to the onlay, you now have a magical solution uh, to the problem. In other words, the veneer goes along for the ride with the onlay. And all you have to do is connect the junction between the veneer margin and the onlay interproximally in a smooth way, make sure there's enough bulk there, and you can have yourself a really nice restoration that the patient is going to really appreciate the fact that you were able to blend the restoration in with the other restorations. So I, I like to think this way when it comes to harmonizing aesthetic situations. Okay, so I guess we should um, talk about all ceramic crowns. This is what we do most of the time in dentistry. Uh, we, we do mostly fillings and we do full crowns. That's uh, quite frankly, what most of us end up doing in our practices. I love doing inlays and onlays and um, I would prefer to do veneers and inlays and onlays uh, versus crowns, but crowns seem to be the indication that we're dealing with most often. Uh, a lot of times uh, these teeth have already got a crown, we're replacing them. Uh, and uh, it's, I think it's important for us to get into the details of the crowns. When you look at what laboratories are telling us, they're, they're actually telling us how to prepare teeth. And, and that's pretty sad. Uh, I think that we dentists should be telling the labs how teeth should be prepared, not the other way around. But what's happened is that there's just such a lack of consistency in training and dental schools are teaching different things in different parts of the country. In fact, some dental schools teach different things in the same school. Uh, it depends on which faculty member you work with. So you know, there's, it's no wonder that there's a lot of confusion. And so the labs are making these recommendations. I may agree with some of these and some of these recommendations I don't agree with. For example, on the J-shaped margin, that's 100%. I agree with the lab, good job, that's right. We should not have a J-shaped margin. That can lead to a lot of issues uh, you know, with fit because that, that little J-shape can break off and you go to cement the restoration and then you have missing tooth structure, you have an open margin. Deep shoulder, hmm, well, Probably not a great thing to do 
uh, for the tooth, but maybe you have to go deep because it's an endodontically treated tooth that's very dark and you're trying to mask the darkness of it. So maybe you prep a little bit deeper. So I don't always agree with that one. Knife edge, I do agree with. Um, uh, there is uh, a segment of our profession. It's a very small segment, but they believe that knife edge margins are uh, an, an exceptional way to treat a full crown. I am not one of those members, trust me. And I, I don't believe that that's an appropriate approach. And having owned a lab, I can tell you that my lab technicians had the hardest time dealing with doctors who just gave knife edge margins because we would have to bulk up the material to, to basically deal with the fact that it was a knife edge. Undercuts, um, I agree with that too. Undercuts are a big issue. They should be blocked out before you give it to the lab. But, you know, doctor, don't let the lab block out a problem. You block it out. Don't, don't leave them with an undercut. Um, take care of that. And by placing either flowable or glass cyanamer into that defect. Rough margins are problems, that's for sure. Um, I agree with that. And for, for to, to remedy that, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, you have to use the right burr at the right speed with the right eyes. And so that means that you're going to want to use a fine diamond and not a coarse diamond. You're going to want to slow down your handpiece so that it's spinning at about 10,000 RPM. And you want to use high magnification, uh, like our Univet uh, sponsors here today. Uh, grooves, I don't agree with the lab. I think grooves are, are fantastic. Uh, I use grooves for zirconia crowns and even Emacs crowns all the time. Uh, they're excellent to increase the resistance form, but also they help with retention and they help to help you seat the crown. So by having a groove, it actually can work as a seating tool. Can we mill these? Can we press these? No problem. No problem at all. Uh, parallel preps, no good. I don't agree with that. Um, basically, uh, parallel. I, I don't agree that you should do a parallel prep. I'm agreeing with the lab. That's why the, I'm agreeing with their teaching here uh, that these are preparations that may have uh, difficulty in, in fabrication. And what they're going to do here is they're going to block out your preparation. They're going to make your prep more tapered by adding some resin around the die or doing it digitally. And they're going to end up having a crown that's going to fit a lot looser than it should because it was made too parallel. Sharp edges, I agree with that. We should round these off. It's very difficult to mill into a sharp edge. And remember, every zirconia crown that's ever been made, that ever will be made until they come up with the printed technique, which is coming, uh, is milled. And it needs to be milled by a machine that is going to have burrs in it that have to get into this small little area and mill out that sharp edge. It's very difficult to that for, for the machines to do that. You're asking too much. Um, the last one I completely disagree with. I think the lab is is 100% wrong in this, uh, this contraindication. This one is absolutely a must. We need to have a difference between the anterior... Uh, Anti and anterior crowns between the facial and the interproximal because we want to follow the tissue level and we want to preserve the supracrestal attachment zone, um, formerly known as the biolog biologic width area. So, you know, the labs are trying to help us out, but they're not even uh, correct in their recommendations. And then I see things like this and I just, I just want to scream because posterior crowns with one millimeter off the top, are you kidding me? That, that's completely a, a ridiculous recommendation. Those are, are not going to have long-term survival. Uh, that is way too thin. There's no room for anatomy. Uh, I would highly uh, recommend not doing that. Anterior crowns, you could possibly get away with 0.8 millimeters, but I, I sort of wonder, well, why are you doing the crown in the first place? Aren't we trying to improve aesthetics? Don't we want to have more room for incisal translucency? So I think that 0.8 millimeters is, is um, not a good idea. My recommendation on, on the, these is that we can be more conservative on the axial reduction than they're showing you, and but we should be more aggressive on the occlusal. So it's a very different uh, set of rules. Um, this is Gordon Christensen, and, and you know he's a guy that's been in dentistry for over 50 years, 
And he's a, he's a very good dentist. He's a prosthodontist. He also has a PhD and a master's degree and all this stuff. And what Gordon has recommended, you know, you kind of, you listen to somebody that has that level of understanding very carefully. And uh, I, I, I looked at his recommendation. And I go, my goodness, this is exactly what we're teaching. And I came to my teaching at UCLA. And after I left UCLA, it's what I'm teaching at my, my teaching center too. Uh, we came to these same conclusions based on the preponderance of the evidence and the results, the failures that happen. Why do they fail? So Dr. Christensen's findings and my findings uh, converge almost exactly the same. The only thing that I would potentially disagree with is I think that 20 degrees of total taper is, is a lot. And I try to make it, I would say probably 15 or 16 degrees or less would be my recommendation, number one. And number two, four millimeters of axial wall height is not always possible. So I say three millimeters is probably a good bet. And then if you don't, if you don't have four millimeters, you can place grooves. And I'll show you a case a little bit later where we place grooves. And then uh, occlusal reduction, 1.5 minimum. I 100% agree with him. And then axial depth, 0.6 millimeters minimum. I usually recommend 0.8. So we are so close on this. And we came to these, the, the, these conclusions independently. And I'm just was kind of, uh, I was enthusiastically reading his paper on this topic thinking, oh my gosh, that's fantastic. This, he's talking to general dentists all over this country, all over every week. He's got a seminar someplace. He's spoken to thousands and thousands of dentists. And um, I think that he's somebody that uh, I highly respect and I appreciate him coming up with that recommendation. Now, what if you don't want to remember all those numbers? You want something really simple? Well, you can always do this one, one, two, three, four, and you're going to be okay. You know, if this is, if this is all you ever do in your practice is all ceramic crowns, with one millimeter shoulders, two millimeters of occlusal clearance, three occlusal planes. So you have anatomical resistance form, very important. And you have four millimeters of axial wall height. And you take a nice impression or a clean scan. If this is what you do, you will be at the top of the pyramid in success. So you can look at those recommendations we just gave and you can just modify them into a simplistic manner and just do one, two, three, four. Uh, several of my friends that are clinicians do exactly this. This is what they do. They just, nope, I don't do 0.6. I don't do 0.8. I do one millimeter shoulder and 1.5 off the top. No way. I'm doing two millimeters and they follow this and it's been very, very successful. So it's nice to have this to fall back on. Okay. So we have to talked about finish lines a little bit, and I'm assuming that most of you understand most of them, but let's just make sure we're really, really clear here because this is an area where there's a significant amount of confusion. And I mean, significant, enormous confusion. So if we look at the far left, when we have a, a, an angle that's nearly 90 degrees internally and externally, that would be a PFM. And usually it has a little bit of an obtuse angle on the inner angle. It's not usually 90 degrees. We still call that a shoulder. Now, shoulder is going to be uniform depth. It's going to uh, be kind of a small radius, only uh, about two degrees of declination angle of the, of the shoulder itself to resist you know, uh, any J-shaped edges or loose enamel rods. And that's the preparation that has been taught for PFMs. Uh, by the vast majority of, of programs in the country. You can also do a metal margin and do chamfers, but we're talking about the ceramic interface. If we go to the next preparation, it's a little bit more rounded. Uh, the burr here is not quite as sharp. Uh, this would be called a porous-infused zirconia, and we they, the, the margin design is referred to as a radial shoulder. The, the, the radius internally is a little bit wider, and uh, it's it's a little bit less aggressive to the two structure. And we would use these for any time we're placing a, uh, or let's just say the recommendation is that this is the preparation design you should do when you're doing a lava crown, for example. Um, and now we have here in the middle, we have four preparations. Let me skip to the far right. So let's go over to the 
the gold or metal margins, and those are chamfers. Now, those may not look like chamfers to you, but that is actually what a chamfer is. A chamfer is something that has a declination angle of about at least 45 degrees, preferably 60 degrees. And these burrs here do a really good job with this. And this is what we would use for a gold crown or maybe the lingual of a PFM where you know you're going to have a collar, a big thick collar on the lingual of a, of a PFM in metal. You could utilize a margin design like this. The problem is this. All of the ceramic preparations that we do today really should be utilizing the margins in the middle, those four margins there. And they're all called fillet margins, F-I-L-L-E-T. And you may think, what is this fillet? What is he talking about? Well, if you go to the mechanical engineering world and you speak with a mechanical engineer or a machinist in a machine shop, and you show the margin, all those margins there in the middle, they're all fillet margins. And you ask them what that margin is, none of them will tell you that's a chamfer, none of them. Yet we in dental education oftentimes refer to these margins in the middle, these four here, we refer to them as deep chamfers, or we'll call them a heavy chamfer or a modified heavy chamfer, or sometimes we'll call it a rounded shoulder. We're trying to find a word that describes that shape. And that shape is very different than a chamfer. It doesn't have a declination angle of 60 degrees, which is necessary for metal. It has a declination angle of about maybe 10 degrees or so. Okay, so when we look at these, we should really break these up into different categories. The PFMs are on the far left, the PFCs are in the blue, the pink ones there are all the fillet margins for all of our monolithic ceramics. And then over on the right, we have our um, uh, metal margins. Dr. Uh, Mudit Yadav is uh, one of my associates. Uh, we've taught courses together. He was one of my grad students at UCLA. And we've uh, uh, presented this information in Chicago. Uh, we are in the currently writing up a paper as a recommendation to the glossary of terminology in operative dentistry or in, in prosthodontics to to update the terminology for what this margin is in the pink area here. The burrs that are depicted here are all listed. So if you're interested in using the right burr for the right indication, this is just a, um, a guideline. Most of the ones in the middle here um, have a, a rounded tip on them. It's not a flat tip. So they're just different diameters. Um, the KS burr, for example, has a lot of different sizes. You can get a KS1, you can get a KS2, which are even wider. Um, you can get these burrs straight or tapered. Now, why in the world would I wanna use a straight burr rather than a tapered burr? Well, sometimes tapered burrs are just too fat at the top, right? And so you're trying to go between the teeth and do a preparation and to avoid the adjacent tooth, it, it's quite difficult. So um, by having a straight burr, you can more easily take a thin straight burr and have the same dimension at the tip and not hit the adjacent tooth. So it's kind of nice to have a little bit of both. So remember that the traditional design is more of this radial shoulder, uh, one millimeter deep axially all the way around, and it's going to come out to this 90 degrees, and, and that's perfectly acceptable. But the more modern design that we're referring to now is this fillet design. We like to, you know, it's not really a, a straight fillet. It's a little bit obtuse. So the angle that's formed between the axial wall and the, the exit uh, is a little bit more obtuse. So we're looking at that internal angle is something more like 91 to 110 degrees. And then, but fillet margins can be different depths. So if you're doing a veneer, and we're going to get into that in, in um, the next module when you start to get go deep into veneers, um, 0.3 millimeters is very common for a veneer. And people have always tried to describe that margin and no one knows what to call that. They always refer to that as a mini rounded shoulder or kind of a chamfer, you know, and you can't call it a deep chamfer, right? Because it's not deep, it's very, it's very delicate. Uh, so how would you even describe that? The cool thing is the fillet margin, it doesn't matter 
how deep it is or how shallow it is, it's always called a fillet because the shape is always the same. The depth may be different, but the shape is the same. And that's why it, I think it makes a lot of sense to start referring to this. Um, yeah, I, it's my understanding that University of Washington uh, has started to use this term fillet uh, on a regular basis. Also, I think that my colleague at University of Tennessee is using this terminology. So it's gaining some ground, uh, but I can tell you the next five years or so, this will be the term that everyone uses. Um, so the ceramic obtuse fillet is on the left and the radial shoulders on the right. Now, why is this uh, particularly interesting? Well, it's more conservative. You're gonna preserve more enamel. If there's enamel to be preserved, you're going to cut less into the axial wall. So in a way, this is, is this, this is a move towards more of a feather edge margin, but not doing something like a feather edge that is very difficult for to ceramic to be built at. So it's a compromise in some respects between the two margins, or let's not say compromise, let's say it's the perfect blend of the radial shoulder on one end and the feather edge on the other. And then right in the middle there, is the, the optimal design. And uh, like I said, this has been presented before. Dr. Yadav and I have presented this and we're writing the paper on it. And I wanted you all to be aware of where things are headed. Uh, I would recommend that you use this margin for Emacs and Zirconia. And whether you're doing a veneer or you're doing a full ceramic crown that has uh, the need for layered ceramics like a lava crown. I don't think you have to use anything other than this for all of your ceramic for, for the rest <laughs> until new ceramics get invented. So for now, based on the current ceramics that we have to deal with, to me, this is the way to go. And remember, this is not a deep chamfer. It's not a heavy chamfer. It's not a rounded shoulder. It's not a radial shoulder. It's something entirely different. And this term is not new, new to the world. It's new to dentistry, but it's not new to mechanical engineers or even the medical profession. The medical profession describes using fillet margins and fillet shapes, fillet shapes for their um, artificial valves in in cardiothoracic surgery. Um, this terminology has been used for a long, long time. We in dentistry are just late bloomers, I guess. Okay, and I think I have. The kind of burrs that will give you that particular shape are right here. Uh, and I always love finding the red striped diamond that matches with the coarse diamond that we use for doing the initial work. I want to have a shape that follows that coarse diamond. And so when you look at the KS1, the KS1 burr does not have a corresponding KS1F for some reason. But the closest we have is a burr called the 8881. Uh, the 8881 is an excellent burr. This is a 1.2 millimeter wide burr, just like the KS1, 1.2 millimeters. And it's an excellent burr to use for smoothing uh, uh, your margins and obtaining a fillet margin. Remember all the terminology that the first uh, number in the sequence is gonna determine the grit. If there's no number, it's going to be 100 microns. If it's an if that number is an eight, it's 30 microns. A six, it's 125 microns. If that number is a five, it's 150 microns. The middle, the the last three numbers before the hyphen, that's going to be the shape. So in this particular case, it's a tapered round-ended burr that has got seven degrees of total taper, three and a half degrees on each side. And then the last three numbers have to do with the width of the burr at its widest area, widest area, not the tip, not the middle, not the average, but the widest area. So this burr measures 1.6 millimeters at the widest area, which is up at the top. And then to determine the tip, most of these burrs have the same taper and the same length. So it's very interesting that you can determine with a little bit of you know, a little bit of math, you can determine exactly how wide the tip is, and they are approximately 0.5 millimeters more narrow than the widest area. So this particular burr would be 1.1. I'm sorry, 1.6 millimeters wide at the top, minus 0.5. The tip is 1.1. So half the tip is 0.55. So if you used half of this burr tip, 
you would get a 0.55 deep fillet margin. And then you go around with the finishing burr and you're going to be right there at 0 0.6, 0 0.65, perfect margin depth for zirconia uh, restorations, zirconia crowns. Okay, and there's the taper. 3.5 per side, you add 3.5 plus 3.5, you get seven, and that gives you the total taper of that particular burr. And the cool thing is, the shape is the same, whether you're doing a veneer prep or a crown prep. The difference is the thickness of the burr. And that is such a help for us in dentistry because we get so confused with all these burrs. We don't know which burr to use in what situation, how deep to go or anything like that. And it's just kind of nice to be able to pick out a shape that works for ceramic and apply that shape with different thicknesses based on the needs of the material, based on how much remaining enamel there is, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's the, the reason for showing you this particular image is basically the same shape. Okay. Hi, Devin. How are you doing? I'm good. We have a question. Okay. Uh, is there any answer for this question when crown versus onlay? Yeah. Um, that is the greatest question that exists in dentistry today. I mean, it really is because it's there are those extreme situations where you know always going to need to crown it. For example, the easy one is when it's already been a crown. Duh. There's another one, which is when the tooth is cracked and you're 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 afraid that you're going to have the tooth crack in half and be extracted. You need to bind it together. You know, cracked tooth syndrome, things like that. Uh, when you when you want to mitigate issues with uh, with aesthetics, you want to cover over uh, a facial surface, uh, like I just showed you with the Vonlay, but you can also cover the entire thing. Um, maybe you need more retention. Um, even if you're bonding, it's nice to have nice vertical walls. So there might be that. But typically what I do is this. I look at the tooth and I make the decision, is this going to absolutely be an intracoronal restoration or is it going to be an extracoronal restoration? And if I make the determination that it's going to be extracoronal, that means on lay all the way to crown, right? Anyway, from an onlay to a crown, I start with the onlay. Okay, I start with the most conservative onlay I can do. I drop a box, I break contact, I do the block out, I do the onlay, and I look at the remaining two structure and think to myself, would this patient be better off long term? And I'm thinking always kind of for me, it's always. Will this last 20 years? That's my goal. I want every restoration that I ever place to last 20 years. In the ceramic world, in the gold world, I want every restoration to last 40 years, you know? But for the ceramic, I'm shooting for 20 years on everything, whether it's a veneer, an onlay, a crown, whatever. So, and, and if I'm looking at defects along the gingival area that show that, gosh, it could really be improved if we covered that, then I may drop that margin down, but still not an onlay. It's still not a crown, right? Still kind of in the onlay world. It's only when I have a crack or a defect on both sides that I go down that far. Because remember, onlays, when they're performed with capping a preparation design where we shoe over the non-functional and we cap over the functional or we cap over both, when you look at that situation, you're going to get tremendous resistance and retention form that is going to be very similar to a crown and yet doesn't cost as much to structure. So I guess in, in some respects, except for the obvious reasons to do a crown, you can do an onlay almost all of the other times. And that, that's that's pretty exciting. So you can see how there are some people out there that say, I never do crowns, I just do onlays, because they always find some little sliver of two structure that they can save. And I understand where they're coming from. It's almost sort of more like a philosophical position that they're taking. But it's, it's a terrific question, um, and it's one that I think that is going to perplex dentists for a long time. And if you're conscientious, the, here's the thing. If you're a conscientious ethical dentist, you're going to look at what is the best, most conservative prep I can do on this particular tooth. In other words, what is the preparation that's going to last 20 years that, rele that reduces the least amount of tooth structure? And I think if that's the approach you take, you're going to be doing the best dentistry that there is possible. 
Are we always going to agree? Oh, gosh, you should have crowned that or oh, you should have on laid that instead. No, we're always going to have a little bit of debate out there like we do in all professions. It's just the nature of, of the way it is. But um, the key is to to think, uh, to consider all factors and to try to be as conservative as possible. And awesome. with that, I'm going to sound good. I'm going to continue. A couple yeah. more questions here. While, oh, while, you, um, while we're on a break, I just I left it right. up, open to questions and we got some some here that I thought we might want to address. OK, OK. So we have one a little question for doctor. How do you prep axially and approximately with those birds without touching the adjacent tooth? Do you increase the taper? Yeah, I, without increasing taper, you know, I use very thin burrs to break through interproximal. And one of the burrs I really like is the 850-012. The other 850-012, it's really skinny. And if you want an even skinnier one, you can use an 859-010. It's really, really thin. The other thing that you can do, and th there's nothing wrong with this, is that you can place a an interguard between the teeth or a, or a wedge, like, like a fender wedge between the teeth to help protect the adjacent teeth. There's nothing wrong with doing that. As you get a little bit more experience, you'll become less uh, reliant on that to protect the adjacent tooth. But it's a terrific question. And the only solution is you, you prep as much as you can from the facial and as much as you can from the lingual without getting interproximal. And then you have a little area that you just cut right through, a very narrow uh, area. Uh, and my YouTube videos, I think I do that technique about 10 times and uh, you'll be able to see how we approach it. You just ch check out the full gold crown videos. Even though it's, you're not really thinking about a full gold crown, at least it shows you the steps on how to avoid hitting the adjacent tooth. Uh, we have another question here. What is your recommendation? Uh, what is your recommended adhesive system for bonding onlays? Are universal adhesives acceptable? Um, yes, universal. Okay, I answered the last part first. Universal adhesives are are absolutely acceptable. With but you you're going to want to at a very minimum do selective etching, uh, and you could go ahead and do total etching. I will cover uh, the immediate dent and sealing and adhesive delivery, uh, probably a little bit of it tonight before we, before we finish, and then uh, we'll cover up the rest of it in part three. As far as the brands are concerned, there's so many good ones out there. Uh, we, we have virtually every company has an amazing cement, whether it be Panavia V5 or Reliax uh, Universal or Reliax Ultimate, uh, the products that are made by um, uh, next, you know, Nexus um, uh, by Dense Splice product. Uh, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, you can use any of the Ivoclar, Ivoclar materials, Ivo, the the Variolink, and so there's a there's a whole bunch. Um, the gold standard is usually considered to be Panavia uh, V5 in that version five of the Panavia resin cement. Okay, let's see here. Is there evidence that sub G crown margin can minimize recurrent decay? Do you do you do super G or sub G margin for crowns? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is an interesting discussion. Uh, by keeping margins below the tissue level, they're not going to be as um, vulnerable to the acids in the in the in our environment. Yeah, um, to erosion, uh, but you're going to have other issues with um, the difficulty in keeping that margin clean, maybe somewhat compromised. Um, these are some interesting, It's I kind of chuckle because this is what G.B. Black said in 1907, make sure you put all margins in the sulcus where they are immune to caries. And here we are now, 115 years later, bringing this topic up again. And, and, you're, and the doctor that asked the question, you're not the first person. The, this is coming up a lot now. And I think it's because there is this movement to try to bury margins in the sulcus uh, and for aesthetic reasons, and maybe also to try to have them less susceptible to recurrent caries. Um, I, I would not have that as my main criteria for any margin location. Uh, I will focus more on fit, 
uh, making sure we have excellent fit and keeping the margins super gingival when I can. Uh, and if they have to be sub, sub gingival, barely getting into the sulcus area to preserve the periodontal health. But uh, it's an interesting question is I just, I, I, I'm, I think we need to have some really good data to tell us that that's the right way to go. And I don't, I'm not aware of any clinical trials that are ongoing or been published to look at that in the recent years. Okay. I believe we have another one here. Yep. Okay. If there is a pre existing deep composite on just a small portion of the finish line, for example, approximately three millimeters, is it better to have a finish line? on the composite or have a finish line on the cementum and not the enamel because by the time the composite is removed it will be cementum right i understand um what a beautiful question and it it kind of depends on who did the composite so if you place the composite in conjunction with your preparation i think that to avoid crown lengthening surgery uh and to save more tooth structure doing a mark it's my train coming by here, but uh, I think doing a margin elevation procedure like that is a good idea. I typically, I will say this, that when I do uh, this gingerly extensive margin elevation, uh, some people refer to as deep margin elevation, which I think is uh, once again, an example of poor use, poor use of terminology because depth is not something that is towards the tissue towards the bone depth is something towards the pulp. So we're using the wrong terminology here. We don't talk about deep margins. We talk about gingivally extensive margins, but you call it a G-E-M-E, -E, I call it a geem. Uh, when you have a geem situation, I would like to use a glass ionomer in those situations versus a composite because of the, the, the proven long-term bond that we have with glass ionomer to cementum proven. Uh, the, the bond of composite to cementum long-term is uh, pretty weak, and that's pretty well documented. So I know that the, the, the trend is to use composite for deep margin elevation or a gingerly extensive margin elevation. I don't agree. I think it's a big mistake, and I think that we're going to start to see those mistakes pop up in our practices because of the inability of the composite to have a long-term bond to cementum, particularly in an area where it's difficult to get isolation. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm not a dentist. These questions, like you said, are are exceptional. So thank you for everyone attending for uh, for asking these questions. They're great. Right. Hey, yeah, I love the questions. These are very very. Uh, uh, challenging questions to answer quickly because each one of those questions could be a whole two hour topic. Sure. Sure. Well, that's, that's it. Uh, that came yeah, in over good. the break. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm going to get going here and uh, I got my timer set and everything so we can finish a little bit early and have some Q and a, but um, so the standard zirconia preparation looks something like this, you know, 1.5 minimum off the top two millimeters is even better. The axial reduction at the gingival third is going to be the same, kind of about 1.5. But down at the finish line, we can look at 0.6 minimum and 0.8 millimeters would even be uh, more safe for zirconia. Okay. Now, what do you do if you have this situation where you have the red line and the green line, right? And you have too much taper. And... You know, it kind of depends on your camp, where you came from, where you're coming from. So if you're in the biomimetic camp, this is an easy thing to deal with. You're going to you're going to perform a bonded buildup um, and then you're going to proceed accordingly. Uh, if you're in the old school retention and resistance camp, you're going to add a feature that verticalizes that distal wall. Um, I don't believe that. Um, the the uh, technique of just bonding composite is going to uh, be well proven in the literature. Uh, it's pretty clear that if we rely only on bonding, and we're look we're bonding entirely to an to dentin here, 
And we're thinking that we're going to be providing that crown with increased resistance and retention form. You're fooling yourself. There's not a single clinical trial to support that. And all the laboratory studies looking at this show that that, that approach is, is far less robust than this approach here, which would be to add a retentive feature like a box or a ledge of some kind. And you may be familiar with um, one of my friends. His name is Dr. Lane Ochi. O-C-H-I. He's big on dental, dental town. Uh, he has uh, been lecturing on this kind of topic for a long time that we, we really need to reevaluate our love of dentin bonding and understand that as much as we love it, it's not permanent. But if we were to use the burr and create some, some grooves or boxes, we can significantly increase the retention and resistance form. Uh, we can put this composite cement under compressive challenge rather than shear stress, tensile stress. So rather than ripping the bond apart, which would happen if you just bonded it to a flat surface or this irregular surface, but now we create some ditches and some boxes and then place the zirconia into these. Now we've got something that's really going to lock in there. So I'm old school, you may think, uh, but I, I think that the new school hasn't been proven to the point where I want to do it on, the, on a routine. Remember, I want 20 years of service out of my crowns. So could you build it up in the green and then use the boxes on the sides and, and do kind of both? And the answer is absolutely. So let's get the best of both worlds. Let's go ahead and bond, but let's also add some resistance features like in the blue. Okay. And um, for lithium disilicate, we're looking at a preparation that is a little bit more reduced than the zirconia, uh, but also we can be more conservative on the axial walls. It's fascinating about lithium disilicate that we can be more conservative than zirconia on the axial reduction. And a lot of people have that backwards. They think zirconia can be very thin and it's very strong. Not so much in tensile. In compression, yes. But lithium to silicate, on the other hand, has this incredible ability to be more resilient, more able to stretch and then rebound rather than snapping off. So we can be more conservative. After all, we do lithium to silicate veneers all the time that only have 0.3 millimeter of thickness at the gingival margin. Uh, if we look at uh, different types of, you know, monolithic lithium desilicate complete crowns with feather edge preparations versus versus um, in the in the posterior area, and what the cements uh, would show us. It's just I, even though I don't think a feather edge is a really good design, this study looked at what they call a feather edge was actually a preparation that would be like considered like a mini. Uh, fillet margin. And what they found here was after looking at what, 257 crowns, that um, with 1.5 millimeters of occlusal reduction and, an, and a 0.3 millimeter margin, that they only had three crowns failed. And these were cemented with resin modified glass ionomer and glass ionomer. It's unbelievable. We're not even bonding these in position in place. So I think that's pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, so it just goes to show you that lithium desilicate loves plenty of occlusal clearance, but is very able, very much able to handle margins that are as little as 0.3 millimeters. Okay, no need for bonding on Emacs, folks. If you're bonding your Emacs on a regular basis, uh, it's a little bit of an overkill. We don't have to do that. We can utilize something much more conservative. So remember Angela, I talked about her in the first visit, and that was when, you know, Angela is talking about how this was painful and she couldn't chew on it, even though it wasn't an occlusion. And I took a 330 burr and I just, because we had to replace the restoration, we had just no other choice. So as we're doing this, this, this restoration, we wanted to go ahead and slice it off and we went 1.5 millimeters deep and we got to the point where um, we could see that the ceramic thickness was less than 1.5 millimeters. And so uh, the crown had to be completely, this had to be completely removed. We uh, changed the design a little bit 
So basically now it's a, a, it's a complete crown onlay. It's basically a crown that's super short and bonded. You could call it a cronlay. And uh, it was delivered in it, and it dealt with the problems magically. She had no more issues whatsoever. All we had to do was just make sure we had at least 1.5 to 2 millimeters of occlusal space. So why did this happen? What happened here? Well, what, what, what we've postulated is the most likely thing is that the Emax is flexing. And when the Emax is thin, it flexes. And when it flexes, it stimulates the, uh, it moves the fluid in the tubules and it stimulates the afferent nerves that are uh, in those areas. So you actually feel pain. So this all kind of, kind of falls back on the Branstrom theory of hydrodynamic pain. If something is flexing on a tooth, you're gonna feel pain. If it's stiff, you won't feel pain. So what was the solution? just increased the occlusal thickness and dealt with this in a way that was uh, very similar to the way the original clinician did this particular work. So I guess one way that you can look at uh, making sure you have adequate depth is to hold the burr in this particular uh, straight up and down, and then use the burr. In this case, I was using a two millimeter long burr and making these little slits across the preparation in order to get the adequate uh, depth. And these, these can be measured with an RGS instrument. This is called an RGS-1. Uh, we have four of these, four tips. Uh, the RGS-2 is two millimeters long. This one's 1 1.5. And when you do this technique, it's kind of amazing that when you make these little stripes in the teeth with vertical burrs like this, rather than using your diamond on the side, you'll be shocked at how much you probably are under reducing in most of your preparations. It's really kind of interesting. And then once we finish the preparation in the standard method, we're gonna round up all the sharp edges with uh, low speed, uh, you know, we're going at about 10,000 RPM and we're using a red stripe diamond. One of the best views that you can ever have for making sure you have the proper uh, reduction is to look at it from the side like this and make sure that the curve of that facial wall follows the same curve that you would find on the adjacent teeth. A very common mistake that people will make is they'll make this wall straight and then they won't have adequate clearance for ceramic in, in the area near the occlusal. So you want to follow this. Now, if this is CAD cam, you want to make sure that you have no sharp edges up there as well. So whether it's, you know, and remember, um, all zirconia is made with CAD cam. <laughs> so when you're doing zirconia restorations, rounding them off is more important, most likely, I would say, than with lithium disilicate, which you can press. You, you only have one way to make zirconia, and that is through CAD cam technology. So when you have sharp areas, let's make sure we round them like this. Uh, remember the burr is this is an older step burr from uh, Cyric that we make uh, slightly different shapes now. The burr is a little bit different than this one, but if you were to put this burr into the preparation and have it go like this, you can see that the burr itself would need to be uh, using the edge of the burr to cut this. And there's no way that burr could get up into that sharp area. Does that make sense? So imagine this is the burr for the milling machine that's trying to follow your preparation and it and it cannot get into that little sharp peak. So what's going to happen is the burr to over mill that area. It's going to over mill that area. It's going to go deeper into the inside of the crown to get make sure that the crown seats all the way. And the problem with that is that your crown becomes thinner. So when we when we prepare our teeth 1.5 to 2 millimeters, it doesn't mean that the crown's going to be 1.5 to 2 millimeters thick, right? Because it's impossible to crown perfectly rounded and smooth. It's just not practical. You're going to have sharp areas every once in a while, right? But the key is to give yourself enough uh, of, of a extra reduction to allow for the crown to be made and still be strong. Uh, I've talked a lot about, or I've, I've talked in the past, maybe not tonight so much, about milling milling uh, differences, okay? And this is a device that laboratories will use to mill your zirconia, or they'll use a more a larger device. But basically what this is, is a five-axis mill. 
Most dentists do not have five axis milling available with their CAD CAM. Most dentists are using what they call three, three plus two ax uh, milling or just three axis milling. Sometimes people have four axis milling, but what I wanted to show you is what a five axis mill looks like in terms of the five different axes. We as dentists need to know what those five axes are. So when we can talk to our laboratories, we can ask them, hey, are you using a five axis mill? Um, you're not really, which mill are you using? You're using a four axis mill? Oh, no wonder I'm not getting the results I want. So let me show you what a five axis mill, um, it, what it does. And I'll just, this is a short video. <laughs> So pretty cool. That's you can see all five axes there being demonstrated. So now you understand better about how five axis milling works. And these crowns here, they were done by Dr. Lopez at UCLA. She's a talented clinician. She's working on a patient with some failing uh, composite restorations on the upper left. You can see in the middle, uh, she's cleaned them out and then she's done blockouts um, and uh, built them up, took a beautiful impression and delivered the zirconia restorations and they have really nice anatomy. And the reason why they have a nice anatomy is Dr. Lopez gave the lab enough room, number one. And number two, the milling was done with five axis milling. And so you're able to get pretty doggone nice results. When you look in this patient's mouth after those two posterior crowns were delivered, it's remarkable how well they blend in with their opposing teeth, right? If you look at the the, the second molar uh, blending in with the opposing, and then the first molar blending in with its opposing molar and premolar, the, the least attractive crowns in there are the PFMs that are present on the first premolars. So it's kind of cool to do uh, zirconia at this level where you don't even need to, this, this zirconia was not stained after it was taken out of the oven. It was stained with penetrating stains before it went into the sintering oven. So none of the, cover, this, this, these crowns are not covered with glaze. That's oftentimes what you get from labs. They'll cover their zirconia with all kinds of stains and glazes. And the problem with that is all of those stains will wear off in about five to seven years. Also, those glazes are much rougher than the polished zirconia. So what we prefer to do is use polished zirconia rather than um, a, a glazed zirconia whenever possible. So to summarize, let me just kind of go through the preparations and give you the very, very clear parameters for these preparations. Occlusal clearance, 1.5, okay? Margin depth, 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8. And then the margin itself would be a fillet margin. So these burrs on the right are being used um, in, in first for depth cuts and then for reduction on the occlusal and smoothing the occlusal. And then for the axial, we're going to utilize something that will allow us to create a fillet margin. And we may, of course, want to utilize something really skinny to get between the teeth to allow us to avoid over tapering or hitting the adjacent tooth. For lithium disilicate, you can see that the, me the measurements here are a little bit different. We're going to reduce a little bit more off the top of the tooth uh, than we did on zirconia. However, we can reduce less off the, off the external portion of the tooth. We can be as little as 0.3 to one millimeter, all the way up to a millimeter or more even if you needed to, but you can be as little as 0.3. And that's the most powerful thing about lithium disilicate is its, its versatility in how much we can reduce axially. Uh, but the margin, the finish line is exactly the same. It's a fillet finish line. If we're doing an inlay, we're gonna to wanna to have that central area 1.5 millimeters. The axial depth can be a millimeter and make sure that all of your exit angles, your finish lines are not gonna have any undermined enamel, okay? 
could handle that very nicely, particularly if you use hand instruments or nice finishing burrs like this 8850-012 or 8850-014. Uh, excellent burr for smoothing off rough areas. If we look at onlays, we can see that the, the measurements are a little bit different. Uh, two millimeters of occlusal clearance is what we recommend if it's a dentin substrate, but occasionally, and I mean occasionally, very rarely, you can get away with one millimeter if it's entirely in enamel. Now, sometimes a tooth will be in uh, hypo occlusion, maybe it's ankylosed, or perhaps you're opening up vertical dimension with a bunch of uh, overlays, onlays on all of the teeth, and you have enamel remaining. If you have all enamel remaining, you can treat that a little bit differently because the, 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 it's not so much the enamel, it's the DEJ. With the DEJ present, you haven't removed. Remember, when you prep a tooth, you're not only removing enamel, you're also removing the dento enamel junction. And the dento enamel junction serves as the reinforcement mechanism to hold the tooth together. It's so critical to maintain the DEJ. So when you do a crown prep, you're virtually removing the entire DEJ. And uh, very few people talk about the importance of the dento enamel junction, but it is absolutely critical to preserve as much of the dent enamel junction as possible. Uh, but the pulpal depth uh, in the middle is still the same, 1.5, fillet margins, axial depth is the same, and the burrs would be uh, very, very similar to the burrs we've been showing you. For a Vonlay preparation, this is you know, where we're gonna be covering over an aesthetic area, whether it be a maxillary first premolar or mandibular first premolar, or even a mandibular molar in the case of that patient I showed you, you're gonna to need to do some kind of, of a veneer type preparation. And the axial depth doesn't need to be a millimeter at the gingival area. It can be as little as 0.3. So that's why I'm showing you here um, one of the veneer depth cutting burrs. This one happens to be called um, LVS2, uh, which is 0.3 millimeters of, of depth cutting. And you can actually prepare that facial very, very conservatively. Okay. So we're cooking along. Let's talk a little bit about fixed uh, dental prostheses for, um, for bridges. And uh, there's a lot of uh, things we need to discuss. One of them is that you need to be careful about studies like this. This is a good study. It was done by Irina Saylor. She's fantastic. Um, one of dentistry's uh, legends. Um, she's in uh, Zurich at the, uh, at the Department of um, I think she's with, i trying to remember. Um, anyway, University of uh, Geneva in Switzerland, Division of Fixed Prosthodontics and, and Biomaterials. That's right. And, uh, and, and she presented this paper uh, to the Academy of Operative Dentistry a few years ago. And I was shocked because you, you look at the zirconia and the zirconia was only performing at five-year survival rate and 90%. And I thought that number is low. That's a really, really low number. What's going on here? Um, you know, the, the glass ceramic was doing almost as good as zirconia. That just isn't what I know to be true. And here's the problem with this study. It was published in 2000, um, 2015, okay? But it, they received it in 2014 and it took them a year to write the paper. So you have to go back to 2013, go five years back from there. Now you're looking at, you know, 2008 or so, um, we were not even doing uh, monolithic zirconia. The zirconia that is being mentioned in this study is the layered zirconia. In other words, this is the zirconia that we used with uh, a coping made of really strong zirconia. Then we put ceramic on top of it. And what was happening with these is the ceramic was breaking. And so if you read this study, you go, oh my gosh, zirconia is terrible. We should do PFMs. But you need to be careful about studies. You need to be. You need to really understand when they were when they were done, and understand when zirconia was brought into the marketplace. Zirconia has not been on the market that long, so this is a study looking at a different way of handling zirconia many years ago. All right. When we take a look at the recommended connector dimensions, what that means is the area that is between the pontic and the retainer, right? The retainer is the name we give to the part that fits on top of your preparation. Your preparation is called the abutment, right? 
So the abutment receives a retainer and that's part of a fixed dental prosthesis, right? And so we, we don't call it a fixed partial denture anymore and we don't call it a bridge. We call it a fixed dental prosthesis tooth retained as opposed to implant retained. And so the measurements of these connectors is going to be different based on the material. And you look at these recommendations that were originally made, only nine millimeters of connector dimension in the posterior. Well, no wonder they were breaking. I mean, that's just not a lot of, of, of area to resist fractures. So these numbers right here are too conservative. Um, when you look at bridges that that had that framework, like the ones that Dr. Saylor talked about in her study that only had like a 90% success rate, well, here it is. This is the same thing. This is Ariel Rodgrowski, and he was the chairman of PROS at University of Washington School of Dentistry, the prosthodontics program up there. And his study basically showed exactly the same thing, about 89% success rate at five years, because these bridges were done with a two-layered approach. They had the zirconia core, and then they had regular old porcelain put on top of them. And they failed at very, very high number, very, very high levels, okay? So what do we recommend then, if that's the case, what do we recommend for bridges today? Well, I think that you could always do a PFM. And uh, there are occasions where PFMs are the way to go. It's rare. They don't look very good most of the time. There's very few clinicians or technicians that can perform a PFM that looks really good. Uh, and so, so really monolithic zirconia is the preference, not the layered zirconia I just talked about, but monolithic zirconia. And I would recommend the following based on everything that we know now. Lithium disilicate is not a good idea for bridges. Maybe you can use it occasionally in patients that don't have a lot of bite force in the anterior only. But I would use monolithic zirconia 3Y, and we talked about that last time, what 3Y, 4Y, and 5Y is. Use monolithic zirconia 3Y. Don't use the 4Y and 5Y. Not without knowing that you're using something much weaker, okay? The problems we're going to have with zirconia today are because labs are not telling us what kind of zirconia they're using. I was just at a meeting uh, yesterday and I was talking to a laboratory technician that was, he was one of the vendors at the meeting. And I was asking him what kind of zirconia he uses. He could tell me the brands, but he couldn't tell me if it was 3Y, 4Y, or 5Y. And I said, oh my gosh. It's just unbelievable that technicians are just picking their zirconia that looks the best, that's going to make us happy, but they're not always following the, the science. And the science tells us that we should stick with 3Y zirconia and make it look pretty, not by putting a glaze on the outside, but by putting a, a, a penetrating stain into the zirconia before we put it into the sintering oven. In other words, make the stain an integral part of the zirconia rather than plopping on some kind of stain on the outside. And then lava bridges, I don't think it's a good idea. I think for single units, no problem. For, but for uh, bridges, lava, we just have too much problems with the, with the lava chipping. For posterior work, for anterior work, I think you can use it, but also use it with caution. So uh, in the posterior, our, our recommendation is monolithic zirconia, or you can go to a PFM, or you can go to gold. Hey, <laughs> gold is pretty amazing, uh, but rare that patients will say yes to a big gold bridge. And then when you're using zirconia, just use the 3Y tetragonal polycrystalline zirconia, okay? Don't use any of the uh, 4Y and 5Ys, okay? And you have to ask your lab what they're using. So this is a huge recommendation. And we can find that when we do use this type of zirconia, we're gonna have less than 3% of failures up to five years. We know this 100% to be true based on phenomenal research that's been performed by uh, numerous studies. Uh, one of which is the work that's done by Dr. Taysir Suleiman out of the University of North Carolina. He's looked at this very carefully. He's, I think they've studied almost 400,000 zirconia restorations, 400,000 zirconia restorations, and they're seeing the results uh, less than 3% failures at five years when you're doing these things. 
But you got to be careful because if you don't get the connectors right, terrible things can happen. And I'm going to just kind of close with this case because this is a zirconia bridge that failed after only two weeks. And it snapped off uh, uh, dramatically. And this happened at UCLA. I was the chairman of restorative. I had to come out and solve the problem. And what had happened was the, la the, the clinician and the dental student did a great job with everything. The problem was the lab just didn't, did not have enough room because of the tissue thickness to create the connector dimensions that would need to keep this from breaking. So I looked at it, I measured it, and I saw that this did not meet the criteria of adequate thickness for a connector. So I'm going to leave you with the connector thickness here. For Emacs, I would just stay away from posterior completely. But for zirconia, these measurements right here, three by three and three by two, not good enough. For zirconia, we're going to kick it up to a, a much wider connection. So on the posteriors, let's look at 12.5 millimeters rather than just being nine millimeters. For anterior bridges, anterior uh, cantilevers, we can be very, very little. And the work that was done by Jerry Sheesh out of the University of uh, Louisiana in their PROS program has really confirmed that these numbers are very, very good guidelines. And I would share this with your laboratory technicians. Uh, if we look at partial denture survival, okay, 2,000 papers over a huge period of time, 100, 841 restorations evaluated. We're looking at lithium disilicate here. Single crowns, no problem. But look what happens with, with bridges. The fixed dental processes here, their success rates were very, very low. You cannot practice dentistry with 71, 29% of your bridges failing after 10 years. You cannot practice dentistry, not in the United States anyway. I don't think you can anywhere else. Uh, your patients are going to report you. You're going you're gonna to be out of business. So we just simply cannot use lithium desilicate for bridges. It's just not a, a wise decision at this point, unless you use it in the interior and use it with extreme caution. My material selection is really simple. For bridges, use class five, three Y zirconia whenever possible. Remember that you're going to be utilizing the Vita classic shades for this because zirconia doesn't have the 3D shade guide. You can use a 3D shade guide, but you're using it mainly just to give the laboratory technicians more information. If you're going to do something for aesthetics, go ahead and use a class four, but use it with extreme caution and make sure this is not for somebody that's a bruxer or has some kind of clenching problems, things like that. Don't veneer the porcelain. Don't, don't veneer the monolithic zirconia with porcelain. Don't do it. Just, just have the lab do pre-staining. In other words, they do surface staining before they center it. You got to tell the lab, this is really critical. I don't want you to add feldspathic porcelain and glaze to my final zirconia crown. I want you to add the, the staining from uh, before it goes into the sintering oven in its green state. In other words, the state when it's still uh, chalky and 25% larger than its final dimension, have them add the stain at that point, it soaks into the surface, then it goes into the... Uh, the sintering process. And then, you know, it, even if you're not bonding, I highly recommend you sandblast your zirconia and get it nice and clean. Uh, and you can use primer too. And then the primer is going to link with a lot of your cements out there. If you want to do bonding, that's even, even uh, better. But I don't know that you really need to do that. If you have good four millimeter tall walls and enough retention, you can just use uh, glass polymer cements. Okay. And I think that's it for tonight. So I'll leave it open at this point to q and I know we're, we're probably a little bit long, but um, if there's any Q&A, maybe I can handle one or two questions and then uh, it'll be almost eight o'clock. Devin? Yes, thank you. I think we might have some things here in the chat. First off, uh, thank you everyone for hanging out with us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. There's a link in the chat box to access the evaluation and to get your, your CE. So make sure to take some time to go ahead and fill that out. Also, for those of you out there, Dr. Stevenson is a huge advocate of ours for our loops. If you don't have a pair of Univet loops, if you've never seen the optics yourself, go ahead and go to our website, submit a request to be contacted, and let's get a rep out to you. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure hanging out with you tonight. 
and uh, hopefully we get a couple questions here because I know the group's been pretty engaged tonight. So, uh, you know, and, and Devin, I, it, it's, it'd be great if people can contact me too through email. Uh, I think I've given out my email before, but it's RGS, my initials, RGS at Stevenson Dental Solutions.com. And I respond to all emails. I'll give you my best answer I can. I would appreciate engaging with you. Um, and if, you know, we have a lot of helpful information on our website, Stevenson Dental Solutions, check out my YouTube channel. Um, there's a lot of helpful information there. Um, it's all about, you know, just sharing the information as best we can with people. I wanted to mention just one more thing. If you haven't been to Stevenson Dental Solutions in, in San Dimas, go to Dr. Stevenson's website and check out his courses. Come on out and uh, have some fun with him and his team. They're, they're awesome. Yeah, you know, the thing I like about our courses, Devin, is that you've been out here many times. I mean, we have like 12 people, you know, and so we just finished a five-day ceramics course with 12 people. I got to know all of them so well. We had so such a great time. We worked so hard and uh, we did so much thing, so many things. And these, the, uh, a lot of these dentists were very proficient at ceramics already. They were quite good. Uh, but they learned so much anyway, uh, because we can kind of tailor e the course to each individual. So some some need to be pushed a little harder. Some have questions about full mouth rehabilitations. Others were more fundamental. They wanted to know how to hold the burr a certain way. So we can kind of adapt to that because the class is so small. small. And um, the other thing that I love doing is I love demonstrating. So when people want to see something live, you know, YouTube is out there, you know, but I, I do it live for the students during the courses all the time. You get to see me make mistakes. You get to see me fix the mistakes. Um, it's kind of a pretty cool experience. You, nothing like it anywhere in dentistry. There's zero. Not, there's not a course out there that is like the way we do it. Where it's it's super cool. But anyway, um, I'm, I won't keep, I'll stop promoting. <laughs> I was going to say, I was talking to Claire today, Claire today our Univet rep for Southern California. Oh yeah, I saw her yesterday. And she was saying, we, we were both talking about how cool your your facility is and just the vibe uh, compared to maybe some other events. I've been in dentistry for 14 years, been to a ton of CE courses and what you bring is just the real deal. And it's it's awesome. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've used up all our time. We got, we have to go, you know, yeah. it's go too long. So <laughs> tell you what, guys, if you have questions, shoot them out to me. I'll get back to you. I promise. And um, hang in there. Our next session is going to be on. I think um, we have it earmarked for the first week of March. So maybe the uh, second, I believe. The second of March. Uh, I'm available. So let's do it. All right. We'll send everybody a reminder and remember to get all your paperwork done so we can send you your CE certificates. Okay, everybody, thanks for hanging in there with me tonight. I know it was a lot of details. It's going to get a lot more fun in the next module. So stay tuned.